inside the forest. This is the story of when I was 11 years old. I often visited my grandparents who lived right outside the city. Me and my cousins would have sleepovers there during our summer vacation. On one such vacation, our parents dropped us off again to spend a week at our grandparents'. The first two days we played and spent time inside the house and around nearby areas, we all slept in one big room. Me, my brother Sam, and three of my cousins, Annie, Paul, and Laura. Paul was the oldest among us, and Sam was the youngest. We were sitting and telling each other scary stories until it was almost midnight. Our grandma came in and scolded us to sleep. While we were lying on our mattresses, Paul suggested that we should go explore the nearby woods after our grandparents went to sleep, and we all agreed. We weren't allowed to wander in the woods because we were too young, so it was exciting for us all. The next night we waited till our grandparents fell asleep. It was around 10.30 p.m. we grabbed our flashlights, sneaked through the back door without them knowing, and headed out into the woods. As we walked deeper and deeper, everything became creepy, and we were starting to get scared. Annie suggested that we should go back home, but Paul argued saying that we should go further in. The night was unusually quiet. We could only hear insects and owls from a distance. We started joking around to divert our minds. I could tell that Paul was as scared as the rest of us, but didn't want to be looked at as a coward. After walking for about 10 more minutes, we got into a clearing, and on the ground there were circles made with stones, and some candles lit up on sides of each circle. There were a total of five circles, and every circle had a star mark inside them. It was enough to creep me out. I shivered as I whispered to Paul. I think we should get out of here. But Paul seemed very interested and got close to one of the circles and crouched down to inspect some more. Laura got very angry and shouted at Paul. The whole time we were there, I had a bad feeling. My stomach started churning and I felt discomfort. Paul stood up and turned to us, holding something in his hand. Hey guys, look at this. He held out his hand and shouted. It was a bone. Throw it away, I shouted as my heartbeat got louder. Paul laughed nervously and said that it was all right. While this was happening, Sam pulled my t-shirt and whispered into my ears, There is someone standing on the right side and is looking straight towards us. I slowly turned my head and saw two silhouettes of men visible because of the bright moonlight coming into the clearing. I started breathing loudly and without thinking I shouted, Everybody run! All of them saw in the direction I was looking at. And we all ran as we shouted. We didn't even know where we were heading. We just knew we had to get out of the woods. Sam got tired and was slowing down. Paul picked him up and gave him a backpack ride. After running for what felt like forever, we got out and ended up on the east of our grandparents' house where the road was. We stopped by the side of the road to catch some breath, and everybody started shouting at each other and saying it was a bad idea to go into the woods. Sam started sobbing, and we all got quiet. We calmed down and didn't discuss the matter further. I think at this point everyone might have figured it out. We were told by our grandma not to go into the woods because bad people were in there. I think this is what she meant. People practiced black magic inside the woods and we happened to come across one of them. The rest of our way back home, nobody said a word. And upon reaching the house, we got back in the way the same way we got out. It was now almost midnight and everybody had gone back to sleep. For some reason, I couldn't sleep. The same scenario was playing in my mind over and over again. That night, I didn't sleep. The next morning, we pretended as if nothing happened and spent the rest of our stay inside the house. We never talked about it ever again, nor did we tell anything to anyone. We still visit our grandparents, but we never dare to go back inside that forest again. I got my revenge through voodoo. This incident happened 10 years ago. Back then, I got bullied by two punks in my neighborhood every day. They would wait for me in the alley and take all my money, and I would run into them all the time because the alley was on the way to my house. Then one day I couldn't take it anymore and said I couldn't give them money, and they beat me up. I came home crying and couldn't stand the outbursts of anger and pain. I finally made up my mind to take revenge. However, it wasn't like that from the beginning. It all happened because of a flyer I ran into on the street. There was a sentence written on it, We take revenge for you with black magic. I took the flyer home and called them out of curiosity and asked them what this was. They said they offered services for punishing someone who you want to punish on behalf of you. Eventually, I went there to check if it was true or if that person was just bluffing. I reached the destined and opened the door. 
As I got inside, it was all pitch black with just a few lights lighting the hallway. I looked around and saw the walls decorated with skulls. It creeped me out. I shook my head and went straight down the hallway where I saw a man sitting behind a table. He greeted me with a sinister smile and asked, what can he do for me? I went up to him and said, there is someone I want to punish. Then he handed me a menu and told me that he wouldn't take the blame no matter what happens. I agreed and looked through the paper he handed. The paper had numerous monsters to choose from with the pictures beside their names. It had low-class demons and dozens of other monsters. The cost of summoning the monsters also varied for each rank. Among them was even a death god. The cost of summoning the death god was incredibly high. I asked in a trembling voice if it was even possible to summon the death god, to which he replied that it was possible but it was up to the death god if he would take the soul to the afterlife. I looked through the rest of them and they were all quite costly. And since I have been getting robbed each day, I was already almost broke. I asked the man if there were any cheaper options available and he said there was, but said that I would have to put in some work as well. Without letting him finish the sentence, I said I would do anything. Very well, he said, and handed me a contract and told me that I needed to sign this form of agreement. I did, and then he asked me to get him the hair of the ones I wanted to punish. I agreed and left. The next day, as expected, I ran into them again and got robbed. While they were beating me up, I got hold of one of the guy's hair and pulled it with all my strength. He let go of me, and I ran away while he cursed at me. I went straight to the black magician and gave him the hair. He said, good job, and told me to go back home. I asked him when will he help me get my revenge. He told me to call him and he would do the job. I went back home and waited anxiously for the next day. In the morning, I went to check the alley. I peeped through the corner and saw them standing and smoking. I called the magician and he enchanted a spell and the guy screamed in pain. I watched everything from behind the alley. He crouched down and started scratching himself all over. The other guy looked in shock and called out his name as his body twisted and turned. He rolled on the floor and the other guy ran away after seeing this horrific scene. My body trembled as I looked at him, agonizing in pain. I stepped closer and saw white stuff come out of his mouth and his eyeballs almost turned white. I felt a sense of relief and joy. Adrenaline rushed through my body, and after a few minutes, it all stopped, and he passed out on the floor, and I called 911 and left the place. After all these months of bullying, he finally paid his price, but nobody found out that it was me who did all this. I got away, and I am still searching for the other guy so he could suffer the same consequences as his friend. The Occult Town my name is Alice and I live in Wisconsin. I would often go on trips with my husband Mason during summertime. Last summer me and my husband decided to travel through the countryside and visit Mason's mother. It was almost nighttime time and we were passing through the woods. The sky was foggy and it was chilly. I thought it was a little weird considering it was summer and summers are usually hot here in Wisconsin. We have been driving all day and I was pretty tired. We should have stopped at the last motel and continued the next morning, I said. I could see Mason was getting tired as well, and there were still many hours of driving ahead with fog setting in. The need to sleep was weighing on Mason. He then said, we'll stop for the night if we see another motel or a town, and I agreed. I spotted a small dim light glowing in the distance, and as we approached the light grew brighter. It was an old street light leading into a small town. We drove around for a bit before pulling over a large-looking wooden building. It said Maria's Inn, written on the old sign outside the door. Mason said it looked like a good place to spend the night, but I was a bit skeptical. A cold feeling crawled up my spine as I looked around into a seemingly quiet town with barely anyone outside. But before I could argue, Mason had already left the car and entered the inn. Hesitantly, I followed him inside. The smell of fire filled my nose, but nothing was burning. I saw Mason speaking to an old woman. She was sitting on an old wooden rocking chair. I walked up to Mason and asked who was she, to which he replied that this was Maria and she owned the inn. She offered us a room. Mason looked at Maria and thanked her while I stood there looking at an old picture hanging on the wall. She looked like she had been beautiful in her youth, but age hadn't treated her well. Wrinkles and spots had riddled her face now and her veins protruded from her shaking hands. Curly white hair fell from her scarf that had been elegantly wrapped around Maria's head. We settled into our room, despite how old and unused it looked. 
The room was nice with one bed, a small table, a bathroom, and a window looking out over the river behind the building. After freshening up, we laid down and tried to sleep. Mason fell asleep quickly, but I had trouble sleeping even though I was pretty tired. I couldn't help but think about where the people of this town were. I had been having an eerie feeling ever since we got into this town. I got up and sat near the windowsill and looked out. I saw people walking on the other side of the river. They were heading towards the forest. Upon looking closer, I saw Maria holding a lantern and walking with the crowd. She stopped and looked towards the window. I immediately crouched down. I woke Mason up and told him something was wrong. He woke up and muttered what was wrong. I told him what I saw and asked him to come with me to find out what was going on. He thought I was being absurd at first, but then he saw the fear on my face and agreed. We got out of our beds, took a flashlight that was on the table and told Mason to get the car keys as well. We went in the same direction the others did and tried following them with the help of lights that were coming through the trees. We reached the site and hid behind trees. We looked as they all gathered around in a circle and began enchanting what seemed like a spell. Maria was standing in the middle of the circle and raised both her hands towards the sky. She looked up and said something in a different language. There were almost 30 to 35 people present there, probably the whole town. We looked at each other in utter confusion. What kind of ritual was this? We thought to ourselves. Then suddenly the incantation stopped and everyone raised their left hand and sliced their palms. I gasped loudly, but Mason covered my mouth. We knew something wasn't right. Then it hit me. They were performing black magic. We couldn't move and just stared at them. They brought an animal and were about to cut its head off. My heart was racing as tears were falling from my eyes as the animal shrieked in pain. When they held it to the ground, Maria took a machete and as she was about to strike, I screamed. Everybody stopped and looked in our direction. Bring them to me, Maria shouted and a few people came running towards us. Get back to the car, Mason shouted. As we ran, I could hear people laughing. We got inside our car and Mason drove off. We left our things behind and got out of there. We could hear the laughter inside the car and I was shaking like a leaf covering my ears. As we got back onto the road, we stopped and I started sobbing. My hands were shaking terribly and Mason had his hand over his forehead. The whole town was a cult and they were probably doing some ritual. We drove until we found a gas station. Mason brought water and we calmed ourselves down. We spent the night there and left the next morning. We reached his mother's house in the evening and told her everything that had happened. Mason and I still go to therapy after encountering that incident, and we are slowly getting past that experience. The House I am Mary, and this story took place when I was just 13. I live in a small town in Heidelberg and went to a local school with two of my friends, Emma and Abby. We often used to hang out after school hours, usually by the nearby creek or the park in the neighborhood. We would play till sunset and go back to our houses by 7 p.m. It has been years since that incident, but I remember it like it was yesterday. It was almost autumn and the sun began to set early. We were sitting and chatting near the creek. There was nothing to do, and we were pretty much bored. We were thinking about how to spend the rest of our day as it was just 4.30 p.m. and none of us wanted to go home this early. Suddenly, Abby had the idea of exploring the abandoned house, which was just across the creek. People said that the house was haunted, and many passers-by claimed to hear strange noises coming from the house. Some were skeptical and thought that the house was not haunted and was used by alcoholics or homeless people, but she wanted to find that out herself. Me and Emma agreed hesitantly, and we all went straight for that house. This was the first time we got this close to the house. We never hung out in this area and just watched the house from afar. We never saw anyone enter or leave the house, ever. Upon reaching the house, we could clearly see how old it actually was, almost on the verge of collapsing. We stared at it for a while. We were having second thoughts now, and we were a little scared, of course, because of the rumors. But Abby did not believe in ghosts. She wasn't scared, I could tell by the look on her face. She was rather excited. Abby gave us a little speech of confidence, and we mustered our courage and went through the gate. The grass surrounding the house was overgrown, and the house itself looked the one you would see in a horror movie. I gulped as I started walking towards the house. Emma held my hand. Her hand was as cold as ice, and Abby was walking in front of us. We opened the front door. It was unlocked, and we got in. My heart was racing, and I was starting to think coming here was a bad idea. 
We looked around for a bit. The windows were closed and barely any light entered the house. The only light coming through was from the open door. There was old furniture covered with sheets and dust, and the whole place looked dirty and unused. Not even a homeless person would live here, said Abby going further in. Abby, come back here, I shouted as she entered a room, but she didn't listen. Come check this out, she shouted from inside. Emma didn't want to go at first, but I convinced her, and we went inside that room. As we entered, we saw a circle with candles lit up all around it and a pentagram in the middle of the circle. I was scared enough to get out of there as soon as possible. After minutes of convincing, Abby agreed to go back, and as we were about to leave, we heard a distant breathing, and we all froze. It was coming from the room attached to the one we were in. The breathing was heavy and loud, unlike a human. I got goosebumps all over my body and a sudden chill down my spine. Emma was still holding my hand, and I could feel her shaking. We all looked at each other with fear on our faces, and then looked at the place from where the breathing was heard. From the corner of the door frame, we could see a hand piercing. It was skinny and dark, almost black, and then a pair of bright red eyes looking straight at us. It didn't look like a human or an animal. We all took a step back, and as we saw it coming out, we ran as fast as we could straight towards Emma's house. As it was the closest, we told Emma's mother everything we saw, but of course, she didn't believe us. I called my mother and told her to come pick me up as I was too scared to step out of the house alone. We knew nobody would believe us, and we never told or mentioned about this anymore. A few months later, the house was demolished, and we don't know what happened to that creature or if anybody else saw it too. We just knew we were never going to abandon places like that ever again. Sometimes I think, what was that creature? Was it a monster? A mythical being? Or the devil himself? Something happened to my friend. When I was in high school, I had a best friend. His name was Ethan. He had a handsome face and was also very popular in our school. He was always surrounded by girls. I had been friends with him since the first year of high school. He was very social and almost friends with everyone in our class. I was a little bit envious of him because, unlike him, I was shy and timid and barely had any friends. I would often visit his room. He lived in a rented apartment since his parents were living abroad because of work. We would hang out with our other friends, going to cafes, and 7, 11 was our daily routine. It was around June when I started seeing some changes in Ethan. He became quieter and a bit distant and he stopped having lunch with us and even hanging out with us after school. I asked him if there was something bothering him, but he denied saying he was feeling fine, so I shoved it off. This went on for weeks. He even started looking gloomy. I was a bit concerned, so I asked if I could visit his place and spend some time with him, but he got startled and immediately declined the offer. This seemed very weird, since I would often visit his house, and probably I was the closest to him among all our friends. A month passed like this and suddenly he was back to normal. Not only normal, but he seemed much happier and cheerful. I asked if something good had happened, and he replied by saying something better than good happened. I was happy for him, but still a bit concerned, since a weird smell started coming out from him like rotting meat. I jokingly asked him if he worked at a fish market at night, and he didn't reply. He just stared at me with a serious look on his face. The smell got so intense that I felt like fainting whenever he spoke. When I shook hands with him or even touched him, the smell lingered on my body for several days. I couldn't stand it, so I asked him what was causing the smell, but he just smiled at me and ignored the question. One day, me and Ethan were hanging out on the school rooftop and having a normal conversation, when he took out a book and handed it to me and said this was the reason for his happiness. I was a little confused, and so I asked him about it. He told me to open it and find it out myself. The book looked rather old and it had a black cover with bindings falling off from the side. I opened it and it had no title, it was handwritten by someone. I read a page and it had detailed steps about a ritual. The next page had some demon-like things drawn in it and had many disturbing pictures. I freaked out and asked him what it was and threw away the book on the floor. Ethan looked at me and gave a big smile while saying, it even talks about human sacrifices. He laughed hysterically. I told him he was crazy and went down as the bell rang, leaving him on the rooftop. A few days later, he came to me and apologized to me for startling me and invited me more. I accepted the apology and his invitation. After school was over, we walked to his apartment. Upon reaching his room, he told me to wait outside for a bit as his room was a bit messy, so I waited. 
Ten minutes later, he opened the door, and when I entered his room, a foul smell filled my nose. I asked where this smell was coming from, and he told me to ignore it. I looked around, and his room seemed a little different. Candles were lit up instead of lights, and the living area had no couches, rather a big red circle. He prepared some snacks while I sat down near the kitchen, but I couldn't get over the smell. He came back with two plates in his hands, and when he kept the plates down, I saw raw meat with blood placed on it. I crept out and asked, what the heck is this? He said that in the book it was written to sacrifice animals and eat their raw meat. He also said that he offered it to Satan before consuming the meat. I got up as everything started to make sense. I was about to leave when he grabbed me and tried to shove the meat inside my mouth. I pushed him off with all my strength and he fell to the floor. I quickly sprinted towards the door. As he shouted at me to accept Satan, I ran back to my house and never spoke to him. He stopped coming to school and days later we were informed that he had gone back to where his parents were. I will never forget Ethan or the things he did. I never understood why he became like that or where he found that book. I only hope that he reverted his ways and now lives a normal life. The end. Thanks for watching. Don't leave before leaving a like to this video. Also hit the subscribe button to support my work. And as always, have a horrific nightmare, my dear.